it pisses me off when people define the success of a theater professional or a performance professional, dance, music, uh, uh, artistry, uh, graphic, photography, over whether they are operating at the top of their field. Why it. are Love they? It. If you're not Get on em. Broadway, if you're not on Broadway, you're an aspiring actor instead of an actor. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest. I have Travis Spangenberg, who's already bumping into the mic. Mm -hmm. But I forgive him because he showed up with a special cocktail for me. And uh, Travis, uh, we we got to know each other through Visit Savannah. Um, Visit Savannah has a podcast that I produce called Savannah, Georgia, Anything But Ordinary. And Travis was the special guest on the episode about Prohibition. And it's... Um, its involvement in Savannah and Georgia and then the greater impact because Savannah has the the only, the country's only dedicated prohibition museum. So you were kind of the authority on that subject. Yeah, I'm the guy who has to know things and if we don't know things, uh, has to Google it. You know, like... Pretend. It's a really obscure question. You know, I'll tell a guest. I'll tell them, like, hey, you, you told us one that we, we had to look into it. Uh, but yeah, essentially, I've I've spent four years because we just had our birthday on Saturday, or the museum's birthday, at the American Prohibition Museum, and um, I've spent four years essentially absorbing as much information as I can, and I don't nearly have it all. You know, I I, I know way more than the average bear on prohibition, but um, definitely there's so many topics that I'm still uh, absorbing. So how'd you end up there? So I used to, I worked actually uh, right next to the studio um, for years. Um, I uh, managed uh, the ghost tour program at Old Town Trolley with Historic Tours of America, uh, Ghosts and Gravestones, helped train actors there, eventually uh, co-managed the program, and then when the Prohibition Museum opened up, they uh, offered me to uh, go over there and, and, and start up that program uh, as the uh, lead actor, then actor supervisor, and now I'm the uh, creative and production manager. Cool. And um, like me, you're a uh, North Northeasterner, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, New Jersey. New yeah. Jersey? It's, uh, I say coffee. I said coffee to someone and like a guest the other day, and they went, they like stop in their tracks and they go, wait a minute, uh -huh. you're not from around. Here. Online? Do you guys say online or in line? Online. Or you like to be on the internet? No, no, no. Like you're waiting in line for something. That's a, that must be a Long Island thing. Wait. And I almost in line, in line. In line. line. So they say online. In Long Island? Uh, Long Island, New York City. Oh, it's just interesting how all of our like lives and careers kind of weave mm -hmm. and. Uh, now here you are kind of becoming an expert on time period piece cocktails, but your background's in theater. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Um, it, it is. You and your and your first it, love. Oh yeah, to it, this it day, it's my lifelong love. I I got into improv comedy uh, in two thousand. I mean, shoot, I was. I remember as a kid, we would do we would play whose line is in anyway games. On for some reason, our stage was the trampoline. So you bounce around as kids with like guys who never became actors, just the neighborhood kids. We all liked whose line is it anyway. Got into improv, and then I actually helped found the drama club at my middle school, which was kind of the formative school in my educational years. And before we did any plays or anything like that, we did improv games to. to you helped found it. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have any kind of drama program. I, I went to a technology middle school. Um, that was very. It was a charter school. Uh, that was a Sussex County Charter School for Technology, and hmm. it was this um, up in Jersey. Uh, a great school with some of the best teachers I've ever met, uh, some of the most original and inventive teachers, and they, they had so many programs, and we did so much stuff, but drama was one of them, and I got, we basically begged one of the uh, the English teacher to, because he was a theater guy, to, to let us come play around on the stage. Uh, we had a like at our disposal we had a stage on campus because there was um we were part of the we were uh, in one of the high school buildings and right next to it they had a theater that um uh, jethro tull played at gordon lightfoot uh, wow. a beatles tribute band i saw craig ferguson there so we had like big acts so i got to perform on that stage That's awesome. but it started out with improv comedy uh that would have been seventh grade uh so for me that is 2004 to five um probably late into five and then early in the and then that yeah that year and then 2006 we actually did a full length play and that was my first big play I was in a musical in my elementary school that was very bad I had no business being in a middle school or in a, a musical not musical at all just like 
so non-musical acting you like yes yes i mean i love musicals i like musicals because i get to sit and watch them and i you know when you do enough acting every actor has this brain that's like oh well if i was playing that character here's what i would have done and uh, you you kind of you pick apart performances and you think about how you would design it or because you you that's just how your brain works after a certain time but i can't do that with a musical Mm. because I can't do any of what they're doing on the stage. So I really get to sit back, decompress, and enjoy a musical um, without having that part of my brain, uh, the critical side. I just get to enjoy a musical. So I like them. I just can't do them. I have no pitch or music is uh, beyond me. I like music. I can't do music. And is dancing part of that too? Yeah. Oh, God, I'm the least coordinated <laughs> person you'll ever meet. Um, I um my speaking of alcohol, my best friend from uh, high school, uh, he said that because I didn't drink, I didn't start drinking until I was nineteen, and I remember him saying back then, uh, "I bet you'd be hella coordinated drunk," because it's such a reversal. Like if if normal people get uncoordinated when they're drunk, I must get coordinated because I'm so uncoordinated sober. And that I'm assuming did not prove to it, be true. No, no, it didn't. Play <laughs> out. It didn't. Uh, yeah. I'm not really physically messy when I'm. When, I, when I've had a few, I'm more, I'm more verbally, like, I get louder. and I The filter comes off yeah, a little bit. Yeah, well, there's not much of a filter to begin with. But it's just the volume filter or the excitement filter. Mm. So as you're um, um, finishing up high school, mm-hmm. you're still in New Jersey. Yeah. And you're, like, did you already know, okay, I'm going to go for theater? So high school was weird because um, my high school that was the one that I was on the same campus as my middle school I went and my brother had gone there and I had gotten my first taste of just non-musical theater uh, comedies, uh, Neil Simon, uh, on that, watching the high school performances because they were do they weren't doing musicals, they were doing like Neil Simon and other things uh, kind of in that genre. And I uh, loved it and I was like, oh, I can't wait. I'm going to be in that school next year. I'm going to audition. And the uh, prof- not professor, uh, the teacher, uh, the chaperone, the, the director of the drama program, decided that she'd taken on enough. Um, she was also the literary magazine uh, coordinator, so she moved to doing that and said, I can't do the drama program anymore. And the school basically said, well, if nobody's going to do it, we can't do it anymore. And no teacher took up the mantle. And so the, the my freshman year of high school, when I was coming in, was the first year without a play in like four or five years. Mm. And so I went my entire high school experience without getting to do any of it. But I caught that bug in middle school and um, was like itching for it. My mom had me take acting classes at one point, which um, I'm sure she thought were a waste of money because she'd be right. Um, I was put in like the kids class. It was like six or seven year olds because they didn't have like a teen class. They had adults and kids and I was probably 15, 16 at the time. And she, I got put in the kids and she was like, oh, he's too advanced. Uh, the teacher was like, to advance for this I'm going to put him in the adults class and then she was like that's not quite the right fit either uh, and she moved me back to the kids class hmm. and brought on another teen so it was like me and uh, one other teen girl in that acting class so I didn't get to do a lot of it I didn't I, I got to exercise it you know if there was a um, I remember there was history projects where I chose to write a play instead you know you, you exercise your craft that way uh, yeah, I would have known it as a craft at the time but um, the big thing became reading out plays out loud. Cause, um, like a table read? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, when you learn them, uh, specifically Shakespeare, uh, every year that I was at school, except for the senior year, we covered at least one Shakespeare play, and we always read those aloud, as you should. Um, my sister had, uh, for Romeo and Juliet, they uh, read out loud the translated version. The uh, modern English version, version, which I, is a whole another can of worms that I, I hate. Um, I get it for like it's great for a reference and it's good for academic, but the idea of reading it out loud like that mm-hmm. drives me up a wall. Mm. And uh, my little sister called me. And she was like, "Oh yeah, we're reading Macbeth, but we're reading that the translated side." And I, I probably could have had an aneurysm. So we, luckily, my teachers, uh, one of which was the teacher that used to be the drama teacher. Luckily, they had us read it aloud, and they always saw my enthusiasm to get to do plays, and would, I got to do Romeo, and I think I did bits of Hamlet and uh, Iago in Othello, probably someone in Midsummer Night's Dream, too. So that was my outlet. 
uh, was reading reading Shakespeare aloud in, in class. How, did, how did he get away with making up so many words? It's like it's like they made sense in the yeah. context in which he... He got away with it because despite them not being words at the time, and we're not even sure... There may be... It may just be the case of like the first time it was used in the written form and the first time it's on record. But say he did make those words up. The reason he gets away with it is because when he says the word, you know exactly what he means. Because of the context around it. Yeah, yeah. It's the way it's said and the, yes, the context, where it sits in the, and, you know, that's words. If, if, if I say a word and it communicates a picture in your head, I've won. I've, I've communicated. Um, so he made up all these words that we may not even have heard of uh, prior, like all the people of the 1600s England. You could, you could put that word out of context on paper and say, well, what's that mean? And they I don't know, but when they hear it in context, they go, oh, I know exactly what that means. When I have a couple of these and I'm in a foreign country, I start to understand the language. Yeah, right. It's, uh, it, I think if our ears are open to it, we, we do, we, we learn, we understand a lot more than we think. And that's the biggest, because I'm sure we'll get into Shakespeare uh, during this, because that's, that's, that's the theater that I landed on. That was kind of my... Um, Olive branch to the world of rhythm. Um, I get that rhythm, that kind of speech rhythm. I don't get musical rhythm, but I understand, uh, like in my bones, uh, the kind of rhythm that Shakespeare employs. It's the closest thing to music that I can get, and it's really similar. Um, Cadence. Yeah, and I directed my first musical uh, right before the pandemic shut everything down, and I was petrified. I took it on because I want to challenge myself. But I was like, this is, I, I can't do musicals, so therefore maybe I can't direct them. We'll see how it goes. And it turns out the principles of, of Shakespeare translate so well to the principles of music. Because it's both this world where we go today and we look at it and go, nobody communicates like that. We don't burst out in a song and we don't burst out in soliloquies. We don't do rhyming, we don't speak in poetry. But um, both musicals and Shakespeare share this component that the characters are speaking in the heightened emotional language that they are because the circumstances that they find themselves in require that level of passion to process what they're going through is the best way I can explain it. And that's why the most emotional... Nobody bursts out and so on in a musical for nothing. They, they don't do it when they're just like, well, I got my cup, morning cup of coffee. They do it when they yearn for something. And the biggest Shakespeare monologues are full of that driven passion where normal speech, because they were speaking normal in Shakespeare's times. You know, they had words and word structures that we wouldn't have, but they, um, when they went to see a show at the Globe, that language they were seeing, um, I think that's a misconception that people have, is that, uh, you know, they just talked funny back then. And I'm sure there are things that we would have seen them as talking funny. But a lot of what was happening on a Shakespeare stage in 1605 was as foreign to the masses as uh, it is now, uh, but they got it. They understood it, and it's 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 structured in a way where it just gets to the heart of things. So uh, I've always said that uh, you know Hamlet launches into to be or not to be the same reason that uh, what's a what's a big musical that anybody launches. You know Alexander Hamilton launches into my shop. Um, they work on that same storytelling convention. So. What I love about musicals is the same thing I love about Shakespeare, is that it is pure, driven passion mm. on stage. So I don't know I don't know theater, but I know filmmaking. Yeah. And the, what you're trying to convey in filmmaking is not that somebody believes it, that it's real. It's that what they call suspension of disbelief. Right. So it's not that they believe what they're seeing is real, but it's just that they don't not think that it could be real right, right. kind they're, of thing they're able to look at it and go okay that's uh, the moon isn't actually blue right. and people don't actually communicate in this way or they they have to shit and they have to eat but in the movie right. the guy's just killing for 90 minutes you know right if, if, if everybody in the movie <laughs> acts as if things are normal there is no reason to question it right um, that's storytelling um, some of the worst, you know, I love audiences, but some of the worst audience members are ones who are not, and sometimes they're the critics. I've never been a victim of, like, a critic, uh, like the kind of Broadway stuff that happens, like the, the savagery. But that's, sometimes I find that people just can't turn off, and that's why you don't, and I think people get in their way about, and it's especially true with Shakespeare, is that 
you convince yourself that this is something for fancy people. This is for the rich, or you have to be hyper-intelligent to understand it, and you don't. But you have to get rid of that wall between you and what's happening on stage, or you will never enjoy it. People sit in the audience like things they would otherwise understand. Uh, Shakespeare is not advanced scientific theory or anything like that. He's speaking to very real human situations, but because we feel like we're not supposed to understand it, we don't. And so that becomes the problem. And I think that's kind of the mission of anybody who does Shakespeare is to, to break that wall down and look somebody in the audience in the eye and go, you get this. Mm. This means something to you. Mm -hmm. And you got to make it mean something. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a job. And it's rooted in relationships and the forbidden love or like the yeah. complex relationship with the human. mother. Yeah. Uh, it's even his royals are um, uh, Richard II is brought down by huge insecurity. And you won't know that one. Richard II is not, you know, it doesn't get the playtime that uh, Romeo and Juliet or Othello does. But Richard II is essentially about a king who who is hubris. Yeah, who thinks he's God and then is thrown off of the throne, and he has to reconcile the fact that he is not the God. He is not all powerful. He gets deposed. His whole identity is built around this idea of of divine right. God put him there, and then ostensibly God let him be removed, and. He has no identity beyond that. Um, he reckons with this idea of what is a king. And I think we've all, you know, we, none of us are kings, but we've all been through something where we felt like something was meant to be, and then we, we it's something we've staked our identity on, and we find that that's not the case. And uh, it, it can be a crisis. Uh, so I think that's the beauty of Shakespeare, is that he could put kings or dukes into these things and give them language coming to america yeah yeah i was trying to think of a modern day although that's 30 years old but. yeah i mean well it's even you know people say um i'm real sensitive to the idea of, of, of when people say oh that story it's a remake or they've stolen that idea they all are they all are uh -huh. we've been telling stories for as long as humans have been able to communicate which is forever uh greek tragedy goes all the way back to you know in, in bc and uh roman comedy and Roman tragedy. And they were telling similar stories. Shakespeare would have been familiar with them. His contemporaries were familiar with them. Some of their plays are just retellings of those stories. Uh, Julius Caesar and Coriolanus and Titus Andronicus. It's oral tradition. Um, you know, there are certain remakes I don't think we need to see. I think we've had enough... I'd say we have, we've had enough Spider-Man, but I'm really That's happy the that they did this new Spider-Man. Is it because I love Tom, Tom? They finally got it right, but I don't need another iteration after this. Although the animated one was so good. Yeah, well, that's the thing is we all think we've seen enough of something mm -hmm. until someone comes around and reinvents the wheel in a way that makes you go, ah, "That's good. That's a great way to tell the story." The crime in Hollywood is not remakes. The the, the crime is uninspired remakes. Yes, because um, they know they'll they know they'll make a yeah, hundred yeah, million they, dollars and a story that people know. And I mean, you look at Lion King, for example. That's my favorite Disney movie. Um, and I'm not a Disney guy. I grew up watching Jurassic Park more than I was watching Disney, uh, which explains a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, it I, that was my favorite. Uh, you know, I know all the songs. I, the story is it's Hamlet for one. We'll we'll put the Shakespeare aside for a second though. Then they make this live action movie, live action CGI, whatever you want to call it. And the problem wasn't that they remade the same story. The problem was that they didn't try to do anything new with it. And uh, I loved it because visually, I just love animals. And I was like, oh, that's, the lions are talking. But um, generally, that's the problem, is that they didn't try to do anything new with it. Uh, we see Batman. They mess up Batman over and over again, or they get it right. They get it right in Batman Begins or Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. And they get it right in like the video games or uh, people like Batman Beyond. But now, like uh, Jared Leto's Joker is being torn apart. It's not because we had enough Joker. That came out before um, Joker. Joaquin Phoenix's right. uh, Joker, yep. which is is beautiful, and, and and people went, "Oh my God, that's great." Um, something's never bad because we've seen too much of it. It's because it's we've seen it done the same, or we've done it, seen it done injustice. That's my soapbox. So, is there such a thing at this point as original thought? Yeah, oh, that's, that's a big philosophical question. There are plenty of things I watch where I go, oh, I have not seen something like that before. Anything recently? Not to derail you. Mm, 
I don't. I mean, you. Everybody loved to say Hamilton. That Hamilton was revolutionary. But Hamilton, I think, what appeals to me about it is it's Shakespeare. All the same complaints that um, Lin Manuel and I don't want to deify. Well, that's the problem. It's people deified Shakespeare, and he's not. He's just a guy. He wrote some stinkers, and he wrote some some of the best plays that. Just like the Beatles. Yeah, it, yeah, <laughs> we were talking about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some Beatles songs are terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't want anything to do with them. Um, they come on. Who needs to listen to Revolution Nine ever again? That that's the creepy one. Yeah. That one's terrible. Oh, if I heard that at night, I'd leave. <laughs> Wherever I'm at. I remember as a kid in high school when I when I was really into the Beatles, I listened to that one on wireless headphones in the morning. Revolution 9. All alone. And I had to turn it off. It's just so unnerving. There's well, so many sounds. Charles Manson thought it was the sound of the, the apocalypse. I think he's right. Yeah. That's the one thing Manson got right. Uh-huh. Helter Skelter, he, he was a little off on. Um, but yeah, so... So, but, uh, original thought. I, I took us down thought. multiple original, rabbit holes there. Um, God, where did I start, though? So, I said, um, so I asked you about original thought, and you said, um, about it's not often that you'll see something. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, all he's taken was the history of the time that is known to his audiences, at least a little bit, and taken it and put it in a poetic form. Mm. That's exactly what Shakespeare did. All of the stories that Shakespeare was telling, uh, the histories, is stuff that was the common... Uh, everybody knew the story of Henry V and Richard III, or at least they knew what they thought they knew. Mm. You know, they, they knew the propaganda of the time. And he took it, and he took it in a poetic form, and he took liberties. And if we're going to let Shakespeare get away with making Richard III into this hunchback villain uh, child killer, we need to be okay with Lin Manuel Miranda uh, taking liberties with Hamilton. You know, people will say like, "Oh, well, they didn't actually fight over the fact of of um, the presidency when uh, Burr ran against Jefferson and Burr became um, vice president and uh, uh, Hamilton uh, ruled against Burr and basically cost him his seat." The real story is that that was that that was his post. Pres- vice presidency election when he was coming out, I think, to the Senate or something. But Lin Manuel Lin Manuel Miranda can look at that and go, "Oh yeah, but for a more streamlined story, that's going to get to the, the heart of it." Yeah, yeah, it's it's a detour. Mm-hmm. History we can read, we can get real specific about everything. But drama is not history. Uh, the story that's being told there is not Alexander Hamilton. The story is ambition, and the story is ambition versus. Uh, I guess like sacri- their sacrifice uh, it's it's the same story that's told over and over again um, I don't like historical people to get because I'm a historical person obviously it's, it's what I do but to get too wrapped up in holding drama to this idea that it has to be right there is damaging departures you know if you make a historical figure look like a saint who wasn't that is there are there are, pro- there are modern day repercussions for that and there are certain issues with um, Alexa- with, with Hamilton as far as uh, whether Hamilton uh, supported slavery. Those issues, I think, are valid, and especially the people that are bringing them up. But the people that are going to nitpick and go, well, uh, uh, Burr wasn't exactly actually involved in the airing of, of, of Hamilton's affair. You know what I tell you? I don't care. Burr is the villain of the story. He's the antagonist up against Hamilton. And if you're going to introduce some other guy to be part of Monroe's crew, or not Monroe, Madison, I think Monroe was one of them in in real life that exposed Alexander Hamilton's um, torrid affair. Um, You're going to introduce somebody in the third act to do that when you've got this perfectly good antagonist that you've been building up? No, you're not going to do that. Are you telling stories or are you telling history is, is I think, what it comes down to. There's my soapbox again. <laughs> no, um, and there's well, I mean, good storytelling. If we if we go with a more contemporary example, mm-hmm. uh, there there was the debacle of all the new Star Wars films where they're building up the Snoke, oh. the new yes. evil emperor, and then they're like, in the second movie, let's just kill him off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, spoilers. I yeah, right, spoilers. Uh, I tend to get in because I don't. I I love Star Wars, but I don't love. Star yeah, Wars. same, same. It's I, like yeah, I, I, I could have. And my thought is like, I could have done that better. But really, yeah. there's so much, so many layers to it. The problem is, and I think I saw a news article recently where they admitted this with Star Wars, is that they didn't go in with a plan. 
Yeah. They hired three different directors for three different movies. Yep. Um, who was the first one? Was it J.J. Abrams? So, well, J.J. did the first one and, and they Brian brought him Johnson back. Yeah. And then J.J. Abrams. Yeah. Uh, but they, he also did Star Trek. They let, so that's right there. Is but like, he kept starting. <laughs> he got to do Star Trek as long as he wanted. Uh-huh. And it wasn't like an established trilogy. You had it. It Star Wars doesn't bother me as the, the sequels don't bother me as a Star Wars fan. They bother me as a storyteller. Yes. Where you same. have 40 years of story laid out and the prequels for all of their they're bad or they're good. You had 40 years of this saga. And, and then you're like, OK, let's tell the end of it. And you botched it. And you only had one chance. We lost Carrie Fisher in the middle. Yep. And we'll never have that chance again. Well, deep fakes, but... Yeah, deep fakes. Who wants to see that? Yeah. It was enough, the the, the deep fakes that we had of, of her in... Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah that that was enough for good. people. Can you imagine if they did a whole movie? And the value of Carrie Fisher is, is Carrie Fisher's brain. Right. Speaking of somebody who understands storytelling, um, growing up is, is stopping... Um, being enamored with Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia and, and being enamored for her as a Hollywood genius. She was a script doctor for years. I admire Carrie Fisher. Like, number like seven on the list is Princess Leia. It's like her as a mental health advocate and her as a storyteller and her as, as just a personality and a truth teller. And I, I love... I, I, as a truth... Yeah, yeah, her she, is not she's bowing like, down to people. Yeah, no, she doesn't take, take it from anybody. Yeah. So um, that's the problem with Star Wars, though. Uh, those sequels is not anything individually that they did. It's that they worked so hard as individuals. Mm -hmm. Brian Johnson took it in a different direction. And standalone, without all the baggage of of the promises that were made by Force Awakens or by the whole saga, Brian Johnson did some of the strongest, boldest filmmaking. Uh, Some of the... uh, he, He advanced that Kylo Ren Ray story like none of the other guys. J.J. Abrams, in my opinion, failed to deliver on it in the end, and he didn't go as far as he could with the beginning. The killing of Snoke was a beautiful that whole scene. Oh, it was pretty. But then you talk about a narrative, and you go, "Oh, well, you set up this guy." Mm-hmm. Um, everybody I talk to has different ideas about where it should have gone. Mm-hmm. But I think the if you want to identify a problem, is that no- maybe we'll get Zack Snyder's cut. <laughs> he has a cut everything, doesn't he? <laughs> but it's this idea that you didn't talk. You didn't say, hey, this is the arc that we have to follow. Right. Because I imagine J.J. Abrams saw that that uh, Last Jedi and went, that's not what I was setting up at all. And it's all disjointed. Part of it is also that it's like, it's not it's not old Hollywood because it's new Hollywood, but, right. but really it's the old model and things are now, like content is being created it's democratized so it's like by the people kind of thing right. and hollywood still goes by this old system so like to, these creative decisions are being made by like the star wars like somebody that isn't even familiar with star wars right. canon that's or like they are in. but they have like misjudged i mean you look at you want to see someone who went in with a plan with a reverence but a willingness to innovate for the star wars it is favreau and uh, dave filoni yeah, Mandalorian. It's great. Seeing Mandalorian so soon after um, what is it, Rise of Skywalker is the last one makes you just go, what? You had these guys. They were around. Why didn't you let them do it? Fav- yeah. Favreau's going to go down in the books, yeah, in my yeah. opinion. I actually just watched Chef for the first time. It's great. That's a good movie. Yeah, he's a great comedic actor. Yeah, he's, he's just a... That's, that's more even on the drama side. Yeah. Chef. He gets storytelling. He just gets it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see that in The Mandalorian. There's a cohesiveness. And that's what that... that you, The prequels, for all the nonsense about them, they were cohesive. They told the story of Anakin's discovery Descent. and then eventual fall to the dark side. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the original trilogy told a cohesive story of Luke's discovery of his past and his taking up the mantle of a Jedi. Um the last Jedi, or the, the whole, uh, the, the, the third trilogy, the sequels, couldn't decide about how to do Kylo Ren's redemption. They couldn't decide how to do Rey's origins. They couldn't decide uh, the, the 11th hour interaction of Darth Sidious fell out of nowhere. Um, so when people lob on criticism about, I never like to see, um, controversial in this one I'm worried you're going to get Star Wars uh, people all, all fired up if they listen to this but you know they like to complain about cute little um, what do you call them marketing um, uh, 
like oh, when uh, they put a crowd uh, toy in it. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, um, oh, basically um, like, merchandising. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the Baby porgs, Yoda. The Porgs or Baby Yoda. Uh-huh. Okay, so you love this series. You love this world. Star Wars. You need to recognize what it is and what it is not. You can't be mad at the Porgs or at Baby Yoda or at Detours on a stupid planet like the casino one in Last Jedi that people were really mad about um, without recognizing that that is in the DNA of what Star Wars is. Ewoks. And, uh, uh, you know, I can't think of a good example. I'm not versed enough well. But I know there are examples of wasted time in the original trilogy. Mm -hmm. Those are not perfect movies, especially in New Hope. But, but, you know, 40 years of reverence. Same thing with Shakespeare. You have reverence for it, and then you can't see it for what it is, and you can't create new stories that that or new adaptations that honor it, but also move past it in a way that that keeps what's great about the series, but also recognizes the flaws. I think people complain about. Like, I get Last Jedi being a problem, but I think they're complaining about the wrong thing. That actually brings us back to heroes and people make, revering Shakespeare or mm. Alexander Ham- Hamilton or yeah. or anyone that we see as perfect right they had flaws too that's the first thing as a director with shakespeare that i talk about is we forget him forget him there are conventions that he set up that we need to follow and we need to do this like shakespeare but we cannot sit there going like oh i can't deliver this line in this emotionally truthful way because it's messing with the language um or it's um it's not proper like they think when people think of shakespeare who don't want to see shakespeare they think of somebody on a stage doing it with this perfect poise and, you know, physical uh, uh, engagement is important. Like, I'm not talking about, like, poise as an actor's craft, but, like, this could be, your, like, this stiff version of it. They think of that because they've seen that over and over again. Um, because the people that do it can't step back and go, hey, it's just a text, let me bring the character to life. Let me understand what I'm saying and communicate it effectively. They're too caught up on this, but it's Shakespeare. They make it harder than it is. You put so many obstacles in your way, and you put obstacles in the way of the audience. When I'm uh, directing films, I'm ready. I have more. Uh, I have more ice too. But uh, uh, when I'm directing films, I'll tell somebody, "Okay, take a glass," and then people or take a sip from your glass. People go like this. <laughs> yeah, that bad acting. The... And I'm like, no, 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 no. Just do it. Just, just take a sip from your glass. It's like, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm admittedly not great with that. Um, on film, I'm. Uh, well, but then there's also the I'm, elevated reality. I'm a stage actor, yeah. Well, and is stage, you're lit- like, I, I need glasses, right? So you're dealing with people in a big room, that, you know theater didn't have mics back in the day so you had to project your voice Mm -hmm. and everything had to be animated heightened reality and so that's kind of in the dna of theater right but even in filmmaking there is a certain and even in podcasting we're having an elevated conversation we're having just a conversation but there's a certain element of we know there's a camera and we know there's mics between us right so um so there is that don't try to hide it Right, you know, it's it's you're aware of it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna digress. For, but I'm gonna take us back to high school oh, really God. quick. Um, Who wants to do that? This is a question. I just yeah. I just wonder this. My brother and sister are uh, technology people, uh-huh. STEM. They took photography and art in all these classes. I am an artist. I never took photography class. I I ended up just taking a lot of like STEM classes. Uh, digital electronics and, and mechanical engineering class in high school. Uh, and is that is that just a unique experience or? No, so I so I went to a charter school for technology, yeah. which basically the reason it was on the same campus as the high school is the high school was a technical high school. Uh, it used to be called vocational. They've moved away from that name. It was Sussex County Technical High School. So you not only took your classes, but you also had a shop. You essentially had a major. And so um, you would, as part of the middle school program, one period a day would be it, going over to the high school. There were five, five rotations that went over to the high school and five that were done in, within the middle school. And the five over there was medical science, uh, engineering, electronics, and others. 
what else did I do? Maybe it wasn't five and five, but electronics, medical science was one of them, and I know, oh, CAD, uh, computer-aided drafting. Uh, so you got to kind of taste these different things, engineering, and... Um, I was drawn to, like, CAD, because it's, like, yeah. it's artistic, it kind of. It, it was weird, um, and it was a cool program. Oh, and commercial uh, art. We did a commercial art rotation, too. Yeah, we so did a digital like, art. Uh, yeah, 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 it was... Um, Sometimes it was like on on paper, like painting or drawing, or some. A lot of times it would be on on the computer. I think those were the, the the majors. But then when if you continued on to the high school to Sussex Tech, uh, which is where I went to high school, you had to pick one. And for four years, uh, it was like three periods a day for like two hours every day. You were focusing on this one. And at the time, there was none that were artistic. They were all very strict. So what'd you pick? Uh, electronics technology, which was, I found through um, the middle school experience. It was the same teacher. Um, um, and so I spent four years doing that. And there was like this weird wave where you go, I, I remember in middle school, I was like, I remember being like, oh, I want to perform. I, I, I want to do performance. And then when you have to pick that major, um, uh, it's funny. I don't like uh, Louis C.K. performed at my high school. Uh, obviously, long before we figured out who he was. Um, but then, at a, in one of his stand-up specials, well, we kind of knew he was a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. We knew, but we didn't know it was like a, a harmful. We were like, "Oh, he's an asshole." But um, so yeah, I admired him back then, and I think that's a lot of problems with a lot of the way I thought as a young adult. Is is I was like, "Ah, being offensive is very funny," and then you learn like the actual adult repercussions of it all. But Louis C.K., he performed at my high school. I didn't get to go see him. But And then in one of his specials, he made a joke, and he talked about how, you know, I performed at a Votech high school recently. Oh. And I went, that's us! Uh -huh. And he was definitely talking about us, because it was after it was all the right timeline. And he goes, you know, all your life, you're told you can do anything. You can be anything. And then you go to a, a, a vocational school, and they're like, yeah, you can do eight things. And that, that was his joke. And that was the problem, is that you go to a technical high school, and they're like, here are the, the, the trades you can practice. Um, now, um, you know, modern day, my alma mater, if you can even call it that, uh, they do have a drama program. They have a digital production program. So they do, they, they ha ha if I was a middle schooler now going in, I would definitely have a home in, in those programs. But at the time, I had to pick something more technical. And I liked electronics. I liked the idea of building stuff. We had electricity as one of the majors, and then you had electronics. Electricity was like wiring, doing all that crap. Mm -hmm. Electronics was specifically devices. We would, uh, you could bring your iPod into our class, and basically you sign a waiver and say, hey, this might not work, and you might have, it might get broken worse, but if you have nothing to lose, the students can work on your stuff. And we fix people's stuff all the time. Um, in fact, the only times I've used the degree since graduating high school has been uh, fixing people's stuff. Um, it just gave me that troubleshooting brain mm -hmm. that's been really helpful in general. So I picked electronics, and I enjoyed it. I loved it, but I went through this thing where middle school, you're like, I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to perform. And then you're like, well, I have to choose something. And then like sophomore, you're, you're like 15, 16. You're like, well, I need to be practical. I can't get a job so I'm going to go to school for electronics and I even we did a cool co-op program where four days a week four or five days you got to go work at a real place in your trade and then you would spend one day in, and that was like a senior year thing so I got a job at a high-end laser optic manufacturer uh, called Thor Labs in New, New, New Jersey um, that like ships all over the world they have like a, a branch in I think it's like Sweden and most of what I did was packaging but I do like assembly stuff and I got a, I was I was working at the time. New Jersey's minimum wage was seven twenty five an hour, and I'd been working fast food at that. And then I got a raise to seven thirty five an hour. <laughs> Ten the big bucks, days. yeah. Yeah, Wendy's big bucks. Um, and then I went from that to making ten dollars an hour doing what I'd been trained to do in school. It was like, as a kid, you're like, ten dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a wealthy baron at some point. <laughs> um, I remember my first. Yeah, $10 yeah. An hour you job. make ten dollars an hour. You're like. <laughs> But that was in, Jer in Jersey. Now our minimum wage is fifteen. It, but like the minimum wage was what it was here um, at the time. This is two thousand eight, two thousand nine. It was uh, seven twenty five. Yeah, um, I think I started when I was sixteen at seven fifteen or seven twenty five. I think yeah, it was seven fifteen. That's, that's what I was. Yeah. So I, 
I got that job and I enjoyed it. And I remember as you actually had to look college and the rest of your life in the face. You, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went, shit, I can't do this. I can't, I'm, I'm going to be bored out of my mind for the rest of my life. And so I, I uh, went to um, Armstrong here as a theater major. And here I am. Oh, so you came here for school. Mm -hmm. Ah, Yeah, that's how I ended up in Georgia. I, I went to Armstrong. I, How'd you uh, hear about it? So I, <laughs> when you look at college, you know they had those all those sites, College Board, and all that. You you didn't. I didn't go. Well, this one has the most prestigious program. You know, like I, I would have been to go to SCAD if that was the case. If I was willing to spend the money. But what I did do, what matters to me as a human, and this is still the way I am, is I want to be somewhere that encourages me to be the best part of who I am. I didn't want to go to a college that put me in a place. I was bored in rural New Jersey, which exists, if you don't know. Uh, and Pine Barrens, like, of I course. I can't go, uh, no, up, up in yeah. the hills where hill people. Yeah. Um, but yes, Pine Barrens is also an example. And I didn't want to go somewhere that, that made me feel more that way, more small town. So I based everything off of uh, how interesting the city I could get to live in is and uh, how warm it was. I picked four states that had warm weather pretty much year round. Uh, California, Arizona, Florida, and Georgia. And I looked. California was too expensive. And my brother went to Humboldt State in Northern California. And I very much felt kind of like, I want to do something new. Like, I want, me and my family, we're like that. We want to do new things. My sister lives in New Jersey. My brother's kind of nomadic. He's working in Montana right now doing wildlife jobs. Mm. But, like, he was going to school in California at the time when I had to decide. Um, so I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do the same thing as him. Even though... If I went to active school in Southern California, it might as well be a new state from Humboldt, California, which is in the north. But it's basically, basically Oregon. Yeah, yeah, it's basically like the yeah. whole eastern seaboard. Yeah, California. yeah. I yeah. mean, San Francisco is so different from. It's like a like a state like Texas. Mm -hmm. You know, they all have the Texas. Uh, uh, everything's bigger in Texas, but there is you know, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas. They're all so different. Um, so I eliminated California based on that, and then I found one school in Arizona I liked, but it was in Flagstaff, and it was in the mountains, and it snows there. And I was like, snow was the deal breaker. And looking back, I would have loved it. I've been to Flagstaff now. We drove through at night when I went to the Grand Canyon. Um, I think I would have been fine, you know, uh, what, a month or two out of the year. I don't know how long it snows in Flagstaff, but that was the reason I eliminated it. So you chose your college based on weather, weather well, weather, but also the <laughs> thought that you might actually stay there after college? No, I just didn't want to spend four years anywhere that I didn't like. Um, I don't think it's good for the artistic brain. And um, so Arizona was out for that reason. And then Florida, you know, we all know Florida. I, I think everywhere in Florida, I was like, oh, it's, it's one, it's sweatier than anywhere. But it's like <laughs> every city I looked at didn't speak to me. Mm -hmm. At least the ones with theater programs. Um, Tampa. Yeah, I've been to Tampa now, and I think I like it, but I there was nothing that made me go, yes, you should live here. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at Georgia, and the same problem. All the cities, I was like, mm. Atlanta didn't draw me. Certainly not Milledgeville or not Macon. Um, I now I spent time in Macon, and I, I have a little better place in my heart for Macon. But same. as a high schooler in New Jersey, you're very like, oh, I can't go too culturally out of the way and then I, I land on I, I find this school Armstrong on these sites and I'm like man this is a little different and then I mentioned Savannah to people and people in New Jersey start going I love that city um, a guy I worked with at the electronics manufacturer was like I go there every year that's great people got excited about it and I was like what is this and I vacation that year um, summer uh, we did a a New England trip, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and I read Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And I'd already applied by that point, but that's when I knew. I was like, this is a weird town. I'm a storyteller, and I love... I, I, I it's try, so weird. What gets me through life is being able to... No matter what happens to me, whatever bad things happen, as long as it makes a good story afterwards, I don't care. Um, I've had things happen that I'm like... In the moment, they seem awful. I've, I got stranded in a town in, in France uh, in the dark, in the rain. Um, I, got, I got wrongfully arrested at one point. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, but they're good stories now. And, and as long <laughs> as there's no... Uh, uh, Long-term implications. Yeah, because I, like, I ended up getting to the place I was working in France, and I ended up having all everything dismissed uh, 
um, on that whole uh, thing. So now all I'm left with is this crazy story that makes people go, what? Um, I can't think of any other example. I'm sure I have them. But um, what was I, what was it about Savannah for you? Because this is me getting on my soapbox a little bit. Like there is something just weird, yeah, and yeah. you don't. It's hard to articulate until you come here. So and I don't I think never, it works I for everybody, visited. but it worked for me. I've, yeah, I visited one time, and I was like, "You're hooked." I was. I like, say that to guests. Uh, you know, working on tours, and I say, "If if this is their first time, they're gonna be back." It's it's not a place that lets go easily. It's very hard to move out of. They all say. It's for me. It was the quirkiness. It was the fact that it seemed to have all of that southern. I don't want to use the phrase southern charm, but that southern um, individuality, but without any of the things that you associate the south with poorly. Um, of course, when you live here, you're like, oh, well, those things are here. They're a bit of an undercurrent, but still, Savannah is this nice little oasis of, of art and culture and forward thinking. Uh, you know, we have our problems, but that's ultimately what's kept me here is that we value the arts. And I don't, you know, I wish uh, politically they got valued a little bit more. Um, I wish there was money in it. I wish you could have a career as an actor here, as a stage actor. I wish we were a town where people visit and they don't, they go, oh, what house museum are we going to see? What historic site are we going to see? And what show can we go see? I wish there were options for that. And, and there are things in the works where hopefully that could be the case in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But well, what, comedy's comedy's been evolving all, yeah. and growing here. Yeah, it has, and so has theater. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that's um, hit me is, and it was when I so fast forward to when I graduated college, I had a good time, but I was mostly you know I'm on South Side, Armstrong on South Side. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not really feeling Savannah, and then I moved downtown. I start doing ghost tours, and I really get to live in Savannah. Um, I moved to Forty First and Montgomery, which is an interesting area. Um, and I remember at the time telling my bosses over uh, uh, at Old Town Trolley at Ghosts and Gravestones, I remember being asked what my you know six month plan was, what what because they they were already looking to promote me, and I said, oh, I'll be here till the summer, and then I'll leave because I thought I was going to go do summer stock, which is what I had done the summer before, went and done su uh, summer theater, and go out and move to a city where I could uh, start a theater career and be another face in the crowd. And then it started hitting me that Savannah was, well, one, they, they gave me fulfilling work, doing artistic work, creating tours and telling stories. But then I got involved in local theater, and I noticed Savannah has people who want to see it. They have people who want to do it, and a, a kind of artistic environment that fosters theater and, and really performance at large. Mm. So why isn't there a larger community? Well, people. They go get their degree here, whether at SCAD or Armstrong or at Savannah State, and then they have to go and slog at some theater city like Atlanta or Chicago or New York City where they go into film and they go to L.A. And they uh, Savannah is left with less people working at it. Mm -hmm. So I basically made the decision to go, you know what, I'm going to see what Savannah can do. I believe in Savannah. I believe in our capacity to support an infrastructure like that. Uh, smaller cities than us, less artistic cities than us have thriving theater communities, a paying theater. So I've always said, um, why not? Why can't we do it? No, I support it, and I support just artists, period. And even this building mm -hmm. is cool to see and was attractive to me as an artist yeah, yeah. coming to Savannah. And I did, I've bobbed back and forth between the traditional salary route right. to self-employed artist, creator, videographer, back to traditional mm -hmm. and then but in a in a creative capacity creative on right. creative professional now creative entrepreneur um so and i i'm in it for the long haul too so yeah, i'd love yeah. to see the growth of it in savannah the thing that gets to me oh, no, well, one last thought I, I i also interviewed um a woman that went to school for theater and she is from georgia i don't know if she's from savannah necessarily but she's been a pirate at the pirate's house for 10 years and um it, very non-conventional career path for mm -hmm. somebody that is a theater has a theater background so that's actually what fits in with what i was going to say is you you will not. I'm gonna get on a soapbox again. I, I <laughs> do it. The one do it. Me. 
It pisses me off when people define the success of a theater professional or a performance professional, dance, music, uh, uh, artistry, uh, graphic, photography, over whether they are operating at the top of their field. Love Why it. are Love they? It. If you're not on Broadway, if you're not on Broadway, you're a aspiring actor instead of an actor. If you're not even doing like regional work and doing theater, uh, you know, if your paintings aren't in a museum, you're not a painter, you're an aspiring painter. We don't treat anybody like that. We don't, if somebody is an engineer not working at NASA, but they're working at, Gulfstream is even a high level, but like even like a little engineer, uh, like a single, uh, you're the single engineer staff. We don't go, they're not an engineer or they haven't used their degree. There's so much that degrees outside the box can teach you. I, I, you know, I'll always speak for theater. Theater teaches you so much. Theater professionals, if they're good at what they do and if they're smart, make such good employees and other things. We are deadline focused. We are teamwork focused. Uh, we, we operate in a world where getting a project done on a deadline is not, it, like, not it, like delaying it is not an option. We have sure, an open day. Yeah. And teamwork is vital. And we have to learn other things, uh, especially if you work in community theater. You have to learn how to design certain stuff because you don't have that on staff. Or you have to learn, if you're an actor casting a certain role, you have to learn an accent. Or you have to learn uh, how to fight or how to dance Singer or dance intimacy. Or sure. There are all these different things. And that makes theater professionals extreme. We build. We build stuff. At Armstrong, the coolest thing about that program is that you're not just acting. Even if you're a performance major, which is what I was, you learn to build. You can learn to do light design and sound design and costume design and uh, uh, scenic design, uh, painting work, uh, scene painting classes. You learn combat and you learn this and you learn that. Um, so that makes us extremely adaptable, extremely versatile people with a lot of different skills who expect to be taught new things and to embrace new things and operate at the top of their level on new things. So that's theater, but art as a whole, this idea that if you are not acting on Broadway or you're not a photographer uh, of the rich and famous, you are not practicing your craft and you're not using your degree or your degree was a waste of money, I will, I will go off on someone so easy on that because it's just silly and it, and it discourages former artistry. Mm -hmm. I know so many of my, my colleagues now, but they were my classmates that they, maybe they're not acting, they're not doing it anymore, but they use the things that they learn every single day, things that they would not have learned if they had gone to a STEM degree or they had gone to any other thing that their parents wanted them to do. Um, it is an unfair standard to say, oh, well, if you're not, if you're not this, you're not any of it. And that's so stupid. It's, it really is. I have, I've, uh, so this is uh, episode 24 this year, or maybe even 25. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, a previous guest said that, like, if he's a, he's a writer and musician. He said if he reached a billboard level of success, then he would be held to that standard. Right. Suddenly you're legitimate. Suddenly you're legit, but like he would have to, the label or somebody would have to, he would have to make it so that there can't be the creative risks because it has to be something that's going to sell. Right. right, right? Exactly. So he, he felt like he couldn't, he doesn't want to reach that level of success with, with his medium yeah, yeah. Oh, because, I feel that. because he would be selling out in some way. Yes. I said in a, in last week's episode, um, I that, don't feel that way, but I get it. I get it. Same. I, yeah, yeah, same thing. Based on, I can tell you in a minute. Um, I said that uh, my thing I'm most proud of is that I uh, I don't wake up to an alarm anymore. I get... Oh, I, <laughs> I uh, you know, I wake up when I'm right. well rested and, and, I go, and then I go to work for 16 hours. Right, right. But, but like... Uh, it's but my thing I'm most proud of is that I sleep in. So it's like, uh, is that, you know, is am I producing a... A Hollywood film? No, but like I'm living. Well, then you're not a producer. I'm, well, I mean, maybe someday. That, but, well, that's a longer move. Yeah, we'll top off. I think like like uh, you know how teachers, you know, they have all these kids going through their classroom and they don't realize what a lasting impact they're having. You know, necessarily. Oh my God. I try to tell my teachers all the time how much of a difference they make. Yeah, very few of them from high school. But that middle school I talked about, there are two teachers I had in high school that I keep in constant contact with. 
one of them is actually the teacher and I, I came in with such a chip on my shoulder in the high school against her because she abandoned the drama program is what I would have thought as a freshman um, I was so ready to not like her for it but she was I've noticed over the years that my favorite teachers at least in the sub college like before college have been the ones that go okay I get it I'm supposed to be teaching you this this and this but I'm also interested in making sure that you are the best most well rounded human that you can be so that teacher specifically, um, she's retired now, so she's not going to get in trouble. She was showing us movies that we had no business watching in high school. American Beauty, Nudity, uh, Swearing, uh, suggest Drug Content. But she knew that as storytellers, uh, we needed to see this. As mm-hmm. people who were interested in that, um, we watched Election with Matthew Broderick, which mm-hmm. is about a teacher uh, kind of having a weird like sexual fantasy about uh, one of his students played by Reese Witherspoon. It's kind of like American Beauty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, there was a theme. Okay. Uh, and she was, but she really... And Mrs. She Robinson? Would, she would, no, no, no. <laughs> she would let us bring in movies like that. Okay. And um, uh, show them. That wasn't all of it. We did all... Uh, luckily, we were a college course. We got college credit. It was English composition. And she had us reading Flannery O'Connor. And she had mm. us reading all of this... Um, I know there was one thing she had us read about a guy realizing that he was gay. Uh, all this subversive stuff that you, you see it on the news where like uh, a, a, a parent finds out that their kid's being forced to read this and they complain to the school district. It becomes a freedom of speech issue. Um, luckily, nobody complained about her. Um, and she, I still look back on that as going, oh, she's the one who, go, who went... Okay, yeah, English. You need to learn about metaphors and all this crap that's in the curriculum. And, but I need you to understand what it means to tell a good story and how to write a good story. She would give us writing prompts where we could write essentially anything. And I wrote things about murder and about suicide and things that a lot of teachers, at least going by the book, would say, I got to go to the principal about this, got to get him in trouble, I'm worried mm. about this kid. Mm. I was never at risk of doing any of those things, mm. but she was like, let me just let them be creative kids. The other high school teacher was a math teacher, uh, actually, and I don't know a lot of people who feel inspired by their math teachers. I have a math teacher I still connect with from middle school uh, because she was she's just been my cheerleader since and is like all over my Facebook, very encouraging about everything I've done since. It wasn't about the math lessons, but this one in high school, um, by the standards of, of, of the administration, probably wasn't doing what he was supposed to. But he would—he was my geometry teacher in uh, my freshman year, and then calculus in junior year, and then I was his TA for ge- geometry and uh, for the freshman when I was a senior. And he'd spend maybe the last twenty minutes of every class doing the actual curriculum, but for the first fifteen or so, he would do puzzles. Um, he would do what he called numbers in the news, where he put random numbers on a uh, on the chalkboard that all represented a specific thing that had happened that day so that we were fluent in what was going on in the world. It was all the teachers that said, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to teach this, this, and that. Um, But I'm also raising future adults, and they need to be cognizant about what's going on in the world, and they need to understand, uh, they need to be able to write and create the things that they want to create. Uh, They were people that were interested in creating the adults that we were going to be. And mm. I credit, uh, you know, I'll just say, that Mr. Copeland, Quentin Copeland, and Melissa McKinnon with uh, part of who I am today. I have a couple of those too. Yeah, mm. and middle school, uh, they have. I have. A, I didn't even have her as a teacher. I, I stay connected with her. Uh, her. Her name's Jill, and she wrote in my yearbook, "I'll see you on the silver screen someday." They believed in you, and I get real sensitive about teaching issues about um, education and curriculum and about core and what teachers can and can't do. I have teachers friends who go through all this shit Mm -hmm. who um, aren't allowed to do that. And I get real mad about it because I recognize that it's the only reason I am who I am. And I know that's the way to make adults, especially in underprivileged areas in Savannah. Um, I have friends who teach at schools in Savannah that are public schools Mm -hmm. that aren't allowed to go, okay, here's how I'm going to teach this. It's all, you know, standardized testing. Again, soapbox. But it's, it's, it's the best teachers I ever had went, okay, yes, 
teach them the things that I'm supposed to teach them, but I also need to make sure they're prepared to enter this world with a zest for what is in this world and a willingness to create art. So that's them. So tell me about uh, Know Your Onions. Know Your Onions. So um, working at the American Prohibition Museum has been a godsend uh, for years. Um, I've really enjoyed it uh, from my own just personal uh, love of history and my own love of storytelling. Um, It's combined both of those in a really beautiful way, but it's also let me specifically in this last hell year that we've had of creative um, stuntedness where you essentially had to you know, stop all these public events we were doing. That, that This has been my, my life for years mm-hmm. of doing Shakespeare and doing... I was directing When We Shut Down. I was directing that musical Man of La Mancha with the Asbury Memorial Theater. I, I had all kinds of plans about what we would do with my theater company that I helped run, Savannah Shakes, um, started by the uh, Chris Susie and Sheila Bolda, our Shakespeare company, all kinds of things, and suddenly that went away. And luckily, I have people that from the from the bottom down at the American Prohibition Museum and at Historic Tours of America that take very seriously the idea that we are the nation's storyteller, that it is about telling stories and illuminating things for people. And uh, my my boss, the museum director, Kayla Black, has masterminded this idea of Know Your Onions, which is a web series that we do. Um, Available on YouTube. On YouTube and Facebook. You can subscribe. We are currently, we have... Six. Six episodes released. And yeah, I'm working on my seventh right now. Uh, about to release it, probably, definitely by the time this airs. I'm going to work on it literally the next day. Or it's airing right now, isn't it? Uh, so this will be out next Tuesday. Okay, yeah, no, definitely then. Episode 7 will be out by then. And we essentially look at prohibition topics, not just specific, like, alcohol topics during the 1920s, but we look at the before times, uh, just anything interesting during the era, before it, leading up to it, or the legacy of prohibition. And we tell those stories in five or six minutes. They're super digestible videos where we mix but, but you don't slouch on your production value because, like, for the molasses video, you actually had, like, a miniature set, right? We did. That was um, essentially the story of doing Know Your Onions is uh, the first episode we were like, well, we can only do so many things. We, we, we can tell the story. Our, our cheap uh, skeleton of telling the stories is through host spots where me and my, my beautiful co-host, Gabby Heinzelman, are talking to the camera, explaining these things. And then each episode we do, we are um, going... Well, how else can we tell this story? And how far can we take this? And each episode, we're, we're doing something crazier and crazier. The only safe episode we've done was the second one where we explored presidential politics, which was very academic. But the third episode, Izzy and Mo, about prohibition agents that dress in costumes. We had a, a whole bunch of different costumes for me and a bunch of different scenes with a bunch of music and um, background actors and then uh, uh, the fourth episode was about a NASCAR driver, Jocko Flacco, where we went in and we had a stuffed monkey. Fifth episode, like you said, molasses, uh, the, we call it the Boston Molassacre, <laughs> where we got a scale model. And for better or worse, we flooded it with, with, with actual molasses just for a very quick shot, which I feel like was the most Hollywood experience I've had of doing. We spent hours building these scale I'm models. I'm sure, yeah. Games, and then we took one shot of them being flooded. Uh, and uh, we better get it because yeah, this is yeah, it. Yeah, it, we, I, we could clean it off, but it, we ended up not. And then we went down to St. Augustine for one episode. We keep having these moments where we go, Can we do this? And we go, We might as well try. And then for this newest episode, we have enlisted in speaking parts it's me, Gabby, and let me count the actors. We got one, two, three, four, five. I think we got like seven actors all together in one thing in an interrogation we're, we're doing an episode about whether Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger because that is one of the biggest misconceptions mm-hmm. people walk into the museum with this idea that the Kennedy family are only rich because Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger during Prohibition it's not true uh, there's no real evidence for it and we basically go into it and look at some of the figures that might have said this uh, it's going to be a really funny it's a funny episode we keep looking at how much can we do and how funny can we make it while still staying true to the story and not so they're, they're six or seven minutes long we're committed to keeping them short um, 
I got to say the people that like my producers, uh, like Kayla, uh, and above her, we have our marketing manager uh, at the corporate level. They're much better at keeping me because if I was given full control, I'd be like, they can watch a 15 minute video. We're having fun. They, 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 they keep me honest on that. Cause yeah. I'm, I'm essentially Rainbow the director bit. and the editor and mm-hmm. the writer. So without that, I would go all day. I, I was very impressed when I watched them, um, which I've only seen the first five, but I'll, I'll definitely watch so six and one. And two. Yeah, and two is not even. Yeah, and uh, and I, I remember seeing you as an Elliot Ness type. F, uh, uh, oh, when I was when I was Izzy Einstein, the yeah, the bureau agent. And uh, yeah, you're very good, and um, you know, you're we're Savannah's lucky to have you, yeah. and. Um, if you're if you if you're on YouTube, go check out Know Your Onions. Know your onions. If you're coming to Savannah, or if you live in Savannah and you haven't been to the Prohibition Museum, so definitely check it out. They've got the uh, twenty two up Congress Street, twenty two up, right? Uh, two twenty Congress Street. Two twenty Congress, Congress Street up is a good name. That's our speakeasy that's open both during the museum hours Monday mm-hmm. through Saturday, and then uh, Friday and Saturday nights currently. And uh, and again, if you have questions for Travis. Uh, definitely let me know. We create truth at gmail.com. Drop them below. One last uh, thing. Do you have advice for this? Is the last question I always ask. Well, second to last, but any advice for people starting out? They're graduating from high school and they want to go for theater. Do they have to go to one of these big theater towns, especially now in a post COVID world? Mm, God, yeah. Um, no, I don't. I think you need to do what's best for you as an artist. Um, I think. Having, and I wish I took it more seriously, but having four years, in my case, three and a half, because I had some college credits from high school, having those couple of years to just be laser focused on your craft and, and, and acting and doing these things is so important. It all depends on how you learn. Uh, academic Academia is not for everybody. I'm so good at school. I, I, I was raised that way. Straight A's or don't come home. Um, and luckily I was very good at that. I was salutatorian at, at my high school. So it, for me, uh, growing up has had to be like understanding that that is not an approach that works well for everybody. As long as you're doing it and you're taking it seriously, um, because if you go to college and you're not ready to memorize texts, to uh, dig in, to, to understand how texts work, to understand how storytelling works, to be ready to do anything, whether it feels like it's a, a good use of your time or not, you're often wrong. And I have a very good example of that. Um, but, you know, if you have too much ego, if you're not ready to actually look and go, okay, I need to get a lot better than I am right now, and that is a huge waste of money. Mm. Uh, you, you've got to be right for it. Um, my best example with that is... Um, it's very easy in college classes to go, this assignment isn't what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Uh, I was just talking to my professor yesterday about this. Yes, yesterday. Uh, my old professor from Armstrong, Pam Sears, who is one of my favorite people. I've got to be on stage with her, too. She's wonderful. And she had us do a project in a class called Acting with Camera, too, that we um, had to do a host spot. Like, a, I think either like an infomercial or a PSA or one of those industrials where you're like uh, uh, sexual harassment videos. I remember I did like a conserva- a wildlife conservation PSA type thing. It was a project where you had to actually be yourself on camera. Mm. At the time, I blew it off. I improvised it. I didn't write a script. I didn't work that hard on it. And then she gave me an A because she's a delightful person. But I really thought I could do that because I would never use it. It is exactly the principles of that assignment is exactly what I get paid to do for Know Your Onions. Mm. Talking to a camera, telling a story, being clear on a specific subject. It is exactly what I do. And she taught me it. And I didn't, I didn't take it as seriously as I could at the time. And now I do. So um, if you're ready to take things seriously, to dig into the work and work really hard to memorize everything and take every opportunity, go to school. But if you're not ready for that, maybe go do some shows, maybe go work somewhere. Uh, um, wait until you get to a point where you can take uh, drama really seriously before you drop that kind of money on it, is generally what I say. I was I was very hard working, but there are still things that I dropped the ball on mm. that I wish I'd taken more seriously. And I watched other 
colleagues and classmates uh, basically go, ah, oh, I'm not going to memorize. I'll do it the morning of. And it's like, what are you paying for, man? You're in debt now for what? Yeah, we talk about that a lot on the show, too, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, Yo, you better get it something out of it. Yep. So last thing, how can people find you? If are you open to people connecting with you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm Travis Spangenberg is my name on Facebook. Um, more importantly, uh, just as far as what I do, go like uh, one, follow either the American Prohibition Museum and Congress Street Up Speak Easy on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I actually run the social media on that, so those are very important, as well as our YouTube channel. That's my work stuff, my day job. And then as far as theater stuff, go like Savannah Performance Project. Um, that is a kind of one place meets all for the happenings in theater, whether it be auditions or shows to see. Um, That's a, also a YouTube show, right? Like a weekly Yeah, show? yeah. Chris Bass, who runs it, yep. does interviews on there. It's just the thing you need to be following to know what's going on. Mm. And then individual companies, like every one of those, I represent Savannah Shakes and a lot improv. Um, I'm members of those groups. Uh, Savannah Shakes, the Shakespeare company I help run, and Odd Lot is the Savannah's best comedy team that's been voted a couple of years in a row. A couple, I think, God, like 10. It's, it's been a while. Um, go like them. Uh, but also every Savannah theater company in town, uh, Rising Tide rises all, it, it, it lifts all boats. So uh, Collective Face Theater Ensemble, Savannah Children's Theater, Savannah Stage Company, Front Porch Improv. Make it a point to go see a show. Yeah, we're yeah, here. we're coming back, and I, I had a meeting with the theater people of Savannah yesterday. We are all so hungry for this. Now is the time to see the shows. We are trying to come back, and everybody is struggling financially, and we are trying to make sure that Savannah Theater is better than ever. So Savannah Repertory Theater is building a new theater on Broughton Street for visitors to Savannah and really? locals alike. Um Go look at their stuff. They're taking donations. They're creating a whole new theater at Broad and Habersham. It is, wow. It's going to be massive. And they're the only regional professional theater company doing equity contracts in the area. It's, it's a huge, big deal. They're bringing in actors from New York and also casting people locally. And they are actively uh, invested in growing Savannah's theater community. So Savannah Repertory Theater, Savannah Shakes, Adla Improv, Collective Face, um... Uh, Savannah Stage, Front Porch Improv, uh, PAC, that's a performing arts collective, that's a new one. The idea that there are new theater companies rising up, that, that's the ballsiest one of all. The idea that we are just now coming back to live events after the pandemic, and these guys are bringing truthful, beautiful performances. That's it, Savannah Theater, Savannah's stubborn, isn't it? Yeah, we, we, we march to the beat of our own right, drum, we, for it, sure. Anybody would be like, oh, well, you can't continue doing nonprofit theater work for no money. Uh, after this whole pandemic, everybody, when we're like, yeah, prove it. We're, we're very stubborn and we're going to be here. And we want everybody to be part of it in open auditions and in the audiences and in our online content. All of them. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to a successful career. If you have episode feedback or guest suggestions, you can email me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com. You can visit us at creative-truth.com to learn more about what we do, who we are, send me a message, buy some swag. We got hats, mugs, shirts, sweatshirts. Uh, I appreciate everyone for listening. Travis, thank you so much for coming hey, on the show. No it was awesome. Uh, and, uh, yeah, if, if you all have questions, just let me know. I'll, I'll pass them on to you. And uh, we could very, very easily do another hour. So down the road. Oh, only been an hour? <laughs> no, it's been like an hour and a half, I think. Okay. So. I was going to say. So, so anyway, we'll, we'll see you in the next episode. And thanks for listening. Thanks, guys.